<laughs> All right. So about four months ago, it was a Thursday at 4 p.m. We were doing a routine production deployment, right? We do them every week. They take maybe 30 minutes. They're easy. 11 hours later, I left the office. Now, this means one of two things kind of happened. Either our production deploy went really well, and I was celebrating until 3 in the morning. Alternatively, everything that could have gone wrong went wrong with that deployment. Now, you can probably guess which one it was. Now, I'm telling you this story because that wouldn't have been a problem if we'd been using Kubernetes. Kubernetes is like having your own dedicated 24-7 ops team that makes sure your application runs smoothly. And when things do go wrong, it makes sure that that is also handled smoothly so that you can deal with problems in your own time. And that's the reason I submitted a talk for being here today, and which is why for the next 27 minutes, we're going to go over how to deploy and scale Laravel and Kubernetes. Now, you can't really talk about Kubernetes without mentioning auto-scaling. Auto-scaling is this fabled thing that everyone wants, right? You want it to scale instantly and automatically and infinitely. And it's really quite simple. And it's fast. So let's take an example. Let's say you just deployed a new service a month ago, right? You've got it on like a $20 DigitalOcean VPS. You've got maybe five customers. Then this happens. Taylor tweets out that he just used your service. It's awesome. You've got 4,000 people that are suddenly hitting your service. Now, that can go one of two ways. Either it goes really well, because you have auto-scaling set up, and so you can handle 4,000 people, and you just got 4,000 new customers, which is pretty awesome. Alternatively, of course, you don't have any auto-scaling. Your site just slowed to a halt, and all the requests are taking 30 seconds. No one can sign up. Your customers can't even use it. You're getting angry tweets from people that think everything is terrible in life. So let's look at how this works. Now, if we just check out our super awesome service here, which I should say it is the base installation of Laravel, which is a great service, which I'm offering entirely free to everyone here, by the way. Then we're also going to check we're running one instance there. And then Taylor's tweet comes. So we're going to run Siege. We're running 25 concurrent requests. And I'm not sure if you can see it. You probably can't see it that well there, actually. I can barely see it. But it's about 10, 15 second requests here. And in fact, if we open up a new tab, you will quickly see, or rather not so quickly, that it's loading incredibly slowly, right? It's going to take about 15 seconds. So what if we just deploy auto-scaling? Just going to do run one command here. And we're going to get the auto-scaling running. You can see it's still loading that request, right? It's getting up to 15 seconds now. It's finally loaded. And now the horizontal pod autoscaler, which I'm going to get to far later, it's going to kick in. You can see there in the top right, right? We just got a second instance. And in fact, if you now go and refresh that page, or in this case, open up a new tab to load it, you'll find that we have autoscaling. And you might be thinking, oh, it's going to go from like 15 seconds to three seconds. No, it's going to go from 15 seconds to about 0.1 seconds. So that's auto scaling. Now, I know you all want this, right? Everyone's like, oh, I want that, right? 
I don't want my site to slow completely. That looks awesome. How do I get it? And then there are some of you who will be thinking, I don't want to change my code again. I just rewrote all my tests to run in Travis CI like a month ago, and now you're telling me I need to do something else? No, you don't need to change your code. And this is a really appealing thing. Nothing needs to change. You set it up once, and then you just run it. You code your app just the way you used to. You don't have to think about special cases, and it all just works. So without further ado, we're just going to jump into deploying Laravel on Kubernetes. Now, I do apologize in advance, because there's going to be a lot of YAML. And I know that YAML is probably most people's least favorite markup language here. Don't worry, I hate it too. So I feel you on that. Now, in Kubernetes, we have something called a deployment. A deployment looks pretty scary. And don't worry, you're not meant to be able to read this. But it really just does two things, right? The first thing is that it tracks how many copies of our application is running, which you can see by the number of replicas. right? And this is the only thing that we care about when we're auto-scaling. When we're auto-scaling, we're just adjusting this number dynamically, right? So it's being changed on the fly. The second thing it does, of course, is it specifies what code we're running. It specifies the Docker containers. So there's a section in there called spec, and I'm going to go through this reasonably quickly to not bore you with YAML. So you add your containers. You start off with an application container. Now, I've already published a container on Docker Hub, which contains FPM and the base Laravel installation. That's all that's in there. Secondly, you add Nginx. Right, this is just as if you're deploying on a regular VPS. You're adding FPM and with your application code. You're adding Nginx. And of course, we need to expose the container port as well. Right, We're running on port 80, so we expose port 80. But there's another thing you need when you're deploying on a regular VPS as well. Right, You don't just need FPM and Nginx installed. But you need an Nginx configuration to point towards FPM. So in Kubernetes, there's something called a config map. The config map is really straightforward. It is a key value store. You literally just insert keys and values. When you store files, you will usually use the file name as the key and then the contents as the value. Now, I have no reason at all to even show you the contents of this, because this is the exact same Nginx config file that you would use when you're deploying on a regular VPS. That's what I'm saying, right? There's no changes that you need to make. You deploy the same code. So let's jump back to the deployment. And we now need to get this config map, right? Our Nginx configuration. We need to get that into the Nginx container somehow. So in Kubernetes, you just declare a volume at the top here of the spec. And then you give it a name. You're saying, I want to load a volume from this config map that we just created. And you add a mount. I know this can be a bit confusing, but it's quite straightforward, right? You're mounting this Nginx configuration, and you're mounting it into the path etc nginx nginx.conf. Now, we have FPM and our code bundled in that. We have Nginx and the Nginx config. But if you were deploying on a regular server, there's still one more thing you need. Right? You need your environment variables in there. You need your app key, your database password, and all of that. And of course, Kubernetes has a way to deal with this. It's called a secret. Despite the name, a secret isn't as secret as it sounds. A secret is effectively a config map that's just base64 encoded. So as you can see, all the values here are just base64 encoded values, right? 
And so Kubernetes will automatically decode that when it puts it into your environment variables. But this means don't commit secrets. Now, what I mean by this is you can still totally commit the Kubernetes resource called a secret, but don't commit your secret values. Don't commit your API keys. Don't commit your passwords. Don't commit any credentials or Anti from the talk yesterday is going to come shouting at you for security flaws. But you can still commit the secret resource in Kubernetes, right? You can use environment substitution or something similar. So if we were deploying on a regular VPS now, we'd be ready, right? So if we just deploy, it should all work naturally. So to deploy in Kubernetes, use the kubectl command, which is the command line interface for interacting with Kubernetes. And you call apply. And then you use the dash f argument, which passes a file, or you can pass a directory of files. And so in this Kubernetes directory, I just have the config map, I have the secret we created, and the deployment. Next, we can just open up our website, right? And it's going to be there, and everything's going to be awesome. Nope. Unfortunately, it's not quite that simple. If you made a request with our current setup, what happens is basically this, right? We get what's called a pod, which contains FPM and Nginx. That's what we specified. Kubernetes assigns an IP address to it. And so your natural instinct will be, Let's just point the internet at it, right? It's how you would normally do it. Just put DNS there. But what happens if you deploy a second service, right? What if you want to split your app into an auth service and your primary service? Well, you can't point it at both at once. And so we basically need a reverse proxy, right? And so Kubernetes has that built in, which is really awesome and it's called the ingress controller. The ingress controller, for all intents and purposes right now anyway, is just a reverse proxy. And so you can just create an ingress resource, and you tell it to route to where you want it to go. And that's all good and well. So if we do that now, we should have a production environment, right? But there's still one thing missing. The problem is, what if we start auto-scaling it? Now we've got three IP addresses for one service, and we've got two for the other. We need some form of load balancing here, and our reverse proxy, the ingress controller, that can't handle load balancing. So we need some way of handling load balancing, and to use a service for that. Now this is all a big, massive theory lesson about Kubernetes networking which can get a bit involved. So let's jump back to where we're at now. This is what we have. We have a single pod with an IP address, and we have an ingress controller. Now, of course, the ingress controller is a reverse proxy. And if you don't tell it where to go, what service to hit, you get a 404. So unfortunately, we're going to have to dig in and create the service and the ingress. The service is fairly straightforward. You only specify really one thing. You're saying, if a request comes into port 80, that's the port, then forward it to the target port 80 in the pod that is being targeted, right? which is the Laravel application that we just deployed, Laracon 2019. Next, you give it a name so that the ingress controller can then find the service. right? Next, more YAML, I apologize. We go through the ingress. Again, this is, might be a bit confusing because it is very indented, but there's actually only two things that you need. right? You need to have the path, and you need to have a service name, which we just created with the service. So now, 
we've created all this service and Ingress stuff. You've probably grown really tired of YAML by now, and you know, when you go back to try this on your own, you'll be spending you know, 20 hours writing YAML files and being frustrated. Fortunately, that's all there is. We've deployed Laravel. We've deployed Laravel on Kubernetes, and it all works. So we're basically done, right? Well, we're still missing the, the auto scaling. So with all this done right, our application is deployed. We just have auto scaling left. So let's dig into that. In Kubernetes, you have what's called horizontal pod autoscaler, which is a really long name and a really convoluted way of saying this thing just keeps track of how many copies of your application are running. All it does is it scales this pod, right, with FPM and Nginx, scales that up and down based on whatever metrics you choose. In fact, you can scale it based on any metrics. You can scale it based on latency, or you could scale it on CPU or memory, or you could scale it based on how many people are in your office right now if you set up a custom metric to track that. Now, we don't want our site to be slow. That's why we added auto scaling in the first place. That's why we want it. And so a natural thing to do is of course you scale on latency, right? You wanna make sure that your site loads quickly so you can scale on request time. This is what a horizontal pod autoscaler looks like. I know it's a lot of YAML. Unfortunately, this is also the most important YAML file of the entire talk, which means we're gonna have to go through it. So I'm gonna try to simplify this and only highlight the important parts here. So you start with a target reference. And even though it's like four attributes and nested three levels deep, it does one thing. It tells you what it is you want to scale. So we deployed a deployment. That's what we created that contains our containers. That's really awkward to say. And so we just say, we're targeting the deployment. That's named Laracon 2019. After that, you've got the rest of it, right? So you specify the minimum and maximum number of copies that you want to run, that's the minimum replicas and the maximum. And then, last but not least, the most important part, you specify what you're scaling on. You specify the metrics that you want to scale based on. Now, in this case, I have a metric that's called average request time in milliseconds, but you could use any metrics. Now, you'll notice here, I've set a constraint of 1,000 milliseconds. So what I'm saying is I don't want my site to load slower than one second. But what if you reduce that to 500, right? We don't want our sites to load in a second, really. We want it to load in 0.1 second. So you need to know your constraints. Because if you know that your Laravel application, no matter how much power you give it, will never load faster than 400 milliseconds, if you set your target to be 300 milliseconds, the order scaler is going to see, well, we're not at 300 milliseconds yet. I'm going to scale up. And then it's going to scale up. And it's going to see, well, it's, it's still 400 milliseconds, so it's going to keep scaling up, and then you'll end up at your maximum number of replicas. And you're probably going to end up using effectively all the resources you have, and you'll end up with a massive, massive bill. So make sure you don't set your constraints too tight. Now then, let's go through what this all looks like. The whole thing start to finish in three minutes. Now, that sounds fast, but it doesn't take more than three minutes to deploy to Kubernetes and 
have auto scaling running. So first of all, let's just double check, of course, that we don't have anything deployed yet. And so we're getting a 404, just as we're supposed to. And so we can also just start watching these pods, right? So we're going to check if we have any pods at all. And as you'll see, we don't have any pods running, right? Because we haven't deployed anything yet. So we got nothing there. So then we can jump in and we can just deploy the deployment first, right? We run kubectl apply onto the deployment. And in the top right, you can see it's starting to create that container. Next, we're just creating the Nginx configuration and follow that up by, of course, creating the secret with our environment variables. Now, with all that applied, we're basically at the first step, right? We have the setup that you need for deploying on a VPS. And as we went through before, you're going to get a 404 on this. So if you refresh it, you're still getting a 404. But we already know how to fix this, right? You just add the service, you add the ingress, and it should work. So let's pray. And also hope that I can type correctly. So if we apply the service, it should still 404 because we don't have an ingress yet. But then as soon as we do add our ingress, so again, right now, still 404ing, but you add the ingress, you go back and reload the page, and behold, you've got the most awesome service which Taylor tweeted about. Now, of course, we still have one thing left. We have the auto scaling. So we're going to do what we did before. We're going to simulate this Taylor tweet. We're doing 25 concurrent requests. And just double check that everything is running incredibly slowly. As you can see, it's going to keep loading that for a good, good 15 seconds, maybe up to 20. And then, of course, we apply the autoscaler. Now, as you apply the autoscaler, it's going to start taking in those metrics. And then, after a few seconds, it's going to decide whether or not it should scale up. And so in this case, because it can detect that it's running so slowly, right, it's not responding faster than a second, you'll see that it's going to scale up in just a moment. There we go. So now, if we go and reload the page again, or rather open it up in a new tab, just so you can see that I'm not using a cached version or anything, you'll see that it's going to load pretty fast. It's not going to load in 15 seconds. It's going to load in less than a second. And so we don't need to keep scaling up. And that's all there is to deploying Kubernetes Sorry, deploying Laravel on Kubernetes and autoscaling it. That just took three minutes of applying a few files, which are all, I believe, less than a grand total of 100 lines of YAML. Now, I know 100 lines of YAML is like the equivalent of writing 1,000 lines of PHP, but it's still not bad. So that's all there's to it. Now, I should mention, of course, before you deploy to production, right? before you go back and sit down with your laptops now and you're like, oh, I'm going to deploy in Kubernetes. This feels great. I just learned how to do it. I should mention, of course, this is not production ready. right? And before you deploy to production, make sure that you do all your research because there is a lot to learn. Unfortunately, there is a steep learning curve to Kubernetes. But in this talk, I just wanted to show that it can be easy. You don't need all the bells and whistles. Sometimes you can just get it done with five files. Also, if you're not that comfortable with Docker, 
then I highly recommend that you go and watch David McKay's talk from last year. He did an excellent talk on uh, effectively how Docker works and how to write Docker files and Docker images with Laravel as an example. Uh, so that was last year's Laracon. But now I'm going to provide you all a break from YAML, let you download the kubectl, and hopefully enjoy the next talk. Thank you.